Welcome to Diabetes Bio. This is a new podcast for the Diabetes Journal, which is the flagship research publication of the American Diabetes Association. I'm Darlene Sandoval, and I will be joined each month by my podcast colleagues, Dr. Kirk Haberger and Dr. Kevin Williams. Thank you for joining us on our premiere episode. Each month, we will interview one or more authors of the featured articles of the month that have been published in that month's issue of the Diabetes Journal. We will also use this forum to discuss other articles and conferences of interest and major events in the field. Since this is our first episode, we thought we would take a moment to introduce each other as your hosts. Kirk, do you want to get us started? Absolutely. So I'm Kirk Abegger, and uh, you all have been hearing from Dr. Darlene Sandoval. She's a professor of pediatrics and medicine at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. Now, I've had the fortune of knowing Darlene for more than 10 years now. She was a key member of my postdoctoral mentoring team, and she has been a friend and a colleague ever since. Dr. Sandoval's work focuses on the role of the gut-brain axis in the regulation of metabolism. And she has two general themes to this work. One is focusing on understanding the physiology, pharmacology, and potential pathophysiology of the gut hormone glucagon-like peptide 1, or GLP-1, especially its role in regulating body weight and glucose homeostasis. Her other focus is in understanding the mechanisms underscoring the success of bariatric surgery. Dr. Sandoval has also invested considerable efforts towards diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this includes her work as a co-founder and co-chair of the Women's Interprofessional Network of the American Diabetes Association and director of a new advocacy group called Women Inspiring and Elevating Leadership in Diabetes, or WIELD. You can go to womenleadingdiabetes.com to learn more about WIELD. Now I'll turn it over to Kevin. Thanks, Kirk. I'm Kevin Williams, and I'm thrilled to be joining both you and Darlene on this new adventure. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Now, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Kirk Haberger. Kirk is an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Metabolism at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. His work explores the integrated physiology of obesity and type 2 diabetes, with a particular focus on liver-based regulation of energy balance, glucose, and lipid metabolism. This also includes research on therapeutic targets against metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease, or MASLD. Kirk's works also extends to uncovering novel mechanisms underlying non-canonical glucagon biology, especially its interaction with hepatic insulin action and its regulation of energy balance. Outside of the lab, I know Kirk's passion for endurance sports, particularly cycling, not only keeps him active, but also fuels his interest in energy metabolism and nutrition research. Now I'll turn it back over to Darlene. Thanks, Kevin. So it's my pleasure to introduce, last but not least, Dr. Kevin Williams, who is an associate professor of internal medicine at the Center for Hypothalamic Research at UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas. Dr. Williams and his team study how the brain controls feeding, energy expenditure, and blood glucose. More specifically, his team examines the unfolded protein response within the brain and how neuroplasticity is impacted by exercise and drugs used to treat obesity and diabetes. I know Kevin's interest in exercise-induced neuroplasticity was spurred or at least is inspired by his love of running, which highlights a fun work-life integration. So setting a great example there, Kevin. And I know I've also had runs with Kevin where we have talked about science and life. And so it's great to have you both here. Again, I think Kirk mentioned this, but we've known each other for several years and I've followed your careers extensively. So I consider both of you guys to be great friends. And so it's really exciting to be able to, to start this journey with you. Since this is our first episode, the format is going to be slightly different, but today's podcast includes an interview of Dr. David D'Alessio, who is our current editor-in-chief of the Diabetes Journal. In this interview, we talked to Dr. D'Alessio about his work as editor-in-chief and exciting new initiatives for the journal. We also talked to Dr. D'Alessio about Dr. Dan Port, who was a true, true giant in the field of diabetes and unfortunately passed away this past year. In this month's issue of diabetes, there's also a nice profiles and progress paper by Stephen Kahn et al. that focuses on Dr. Port's career, so please check that out. Second, we interview Gregory Steinberg, who happens to also be the 2017 recipient of the Outstanding Scientific Achievement Award from the American Diabetes Association. 
He's the senior and corresponding author of our featured paper of the month, which is focused on fatty acids and GDF-15. Lastly, Kirk and I will have a rapid fire blitz where we briefly summarize a couple of papers each that we found interesting in the current issue of the Diabetes Journal. So let's dive in. Great. So since this is our first episode, we thought it may be useful to hear from our editor-in-chief, Dave D'Alessio. Dr. D'Alessio is the James B. Wingarden Distinguished Professor of Medicine and Chief of the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism at Duke University School of Medicine. Dr. D'Alessio's research interest has focused on the regulation of glucose homeostasis and abnormalities that lead to type 2 diabetes. His work is directed at the interplay of circulating glucose, GI hormones with an emphasis on GLP-1, and neural signals to control insulin secretion. So Dave, I know you've been editor-in-chief of diabetes for about two years. Can you tell us a little bit more about why you chose to be editor of diabetes? Yeah, it's it's a sort of a hard thing to answer. I mean, I've been associate editor, and like all of us, you know, we step in and do peer review, grants, papers, whatever. I mean, that's just part of our job. You know, diabetes had sort of always been in the background since I was a fellow. The blue letters on the top. Some of my first papers were in diabetes. It was kind of like once they said, would you do this? I was like getting to play basketball at Cameron Indoor or take batting practice at Wrigley Field. So, of course, yeah, that would be great. And so, you know, I saw this as really sort of a, an experience that would so, sort of be a nice capstone on, on stuff I've been doing for years. I mean, service to the community is kind of part of the big scientific enterprise, and I've always found that really satisfying. Right. So, Dave, building off of that, for faculty out there who might consider an editor position, what are some of the things you found most rewarding or most challenging about being editor-in-chief at Diabetes? I mean, the rewarding things so far far outweigh the, the challenges. The challenges have been soluble problems. As I said, the, you know, the community service is important. It's always fun to work with a team and feel like you're you're in some sort of joint enterprise where everybody's working hard to make something work, make something good. I, I really have such affection and um, uh, respect for our AE team, which fell together really nicely. You know, each time I get a review or a, uh, a thoughtful comment, it's just amazing how good the people are on our team, the willingness to to do work, the sort of the the effort and insight people put into their their work is really great. It's been it's been fun to be a little bit creative, right? I've been reading this journal for 30 some years. Uh, it's fun to put little tweaks in that that maybe can make it a little better. The challenges is the breadth of material. I mean, so we sort of the journal Diabetes lays out that we publish mechanistic studies across the spectrum in diabetes. So from clinical physiology to complications, beta cell function, insulin sensitivity, adipose biology, I mean, the whole gamut. So I sort of, I look at a lot of papers that are distant from what I do and think about day to day. It's taken a while, but I mean, to get for my role to say, is this good science? Is it important? And is it fit for our readership? Is it something that, that people will associate with our journal and find interesting there? If you can stick to those things, then sometimes even the, the breadth of material is, becomes manageable. I, I bet we turn, we turn down a lot of really good papers that just aren't diabetes papers, right? They should be in a cardiology journal or they should be in a bone journal or something like that. They are still good papers. But if it's something that our readership or the people who are opening our journal, if it's methods or outcomes that they're not familiar with, it should be in a different, a different place. The decisions can be tough. I mean, everybody, all our AEs are working scientists. We know both sides of peer review. We make decisions and we get stuck with decisions. We all love our papers, right? I mean, to tell somebody that they're they're not going to be accepted is always a disappointment for them. So those those can be, you know, tricky as well. I again, part of having a great editorial board is that those tough decisions oftentimes. Are, are easier to make. So in the time that you've taken over editor, you have, you've had a couple new features that you've added to the journal. Can you tell us about those? 
Yeah. I mean, I, I would say the one of the fundamental differences with our version of diabetes and previous ones is we've kind of broken away. The old mold used to be that the editorial team was institution based, like the last team before us was mostly people at Michigan. And, you know, I think in the days when you used to sit around a table and discuss papers, that was really effective. Given that it's all electronic now, what we decided to do was move it outside of Duke. And so we have, you know, editors from across the country, but but more importantly, across the world, we have three Canadian AEs. We have a Korea, uh, an endocrinologist in Korea uh, and Japan. You know, the, the world submits papers to, to diabetes and, you know, we felt like we ought to have broad representation. And I will tell you, we get a lot of our reviews now are from people that weren't the mainstream diabetes reviewers and editors in the past. And I think that's been really good. We've made an effort to, I mean, I wanted mid-career people and not people my age. I just felt like those were voices I wanted to hear. And, and to a certain extent, those people are still in the middle of active scientific creativity and oftentimes are you know, given big talks. So that's worked out well. We made a, an effort to make sure that the AEs were men and women. And that, I think, has also broadened our reviewers. The thing I would say is the cornerstone is the quality of our reviews. If you send a paper to diabetes, most of the time you get three reviewers and the AE is going to give you some comments too. So whether you get accepted or not, you get feedback. So the podcast thing that you guys have so nicely agreed to take on is is maybe going to be the most important legacy of our time here, because that's just how information gets out now. And I think this will be a real benefit. Paper of the month uh, is something we did. Again, what we wanted to be able to do with that is give some play and attention to first authors, essentially to, to young scientists and fellows. Diabetes Classics is something that we started. It, it resurrects papers from the past. Given that diabetes has been published for 70 years, you can track the history of diabetes research through our pages. And so what we've tried to do is ask each AE to go back and pick a paper that's still meaningful to them and then discuss why it's still meaningful. And in that way, sort of connect the past and the present in a way I think that's important. Science doesn't just erase the the, the background. All of us have had the experience of finding our great new idea worked out in some other form 20 years ago. And, and it's important to recognize people that went before and also the validity of, of, of good science. The last thing is we're, we're doing a once a year now, we'll do a big topical issue with diabetes care and diabetologia. The notion was the three society journals got together and said, you know, what can we do that will have a big impact for the diabetes community in our pages? And so we held in, in at the EASD this year a symposium on the gut microbiome and type 2 diabetes, a topic that confounds me all the time. But we brought in a dozen experts. They hashed out three major questions put on a presentation and they'll write a, symp a symposium proceedings that, that will be published in the three journals. I think we're going to do heterogeneity of type 1 diabetes at next year's ADA. But again, these are, these are novel additions that, that I think will be really useful for our readership. So Dave, you, you really answered the next question that I was going to ask, but is there, beyond the podcast, are there some changes in publication process that you do want to highlight uh, that you haven't talked about yet? No, I mean, I think in terms of process, the ADA staff has this thing down to a finely tuned machine, and the, the process is really good. I can't overstate how good the people at ADA are, how every problem that comes up they've seen before or will give you a thoughtful answer. We haven't done as many reviews in diabetes as we had in the past. We're going to do those in a more focused way. We have a couple of point-counterpoint topics that we're going to put in. The Pathways Award, these huge awards that the ADA has been given since 2014, you know, multi-million dollar grants to really promising scientists. We've gone back and said, hey, guys, you got the big check. Give us three, four pages and tell us how it went. Again, I think that is different than a, a typical review, but it gives people, you know, it'll give people some summaries of interesting and novel ideas that they might not see otherwise. And it connects to the ADA 
uh, and its mission in, in supporting research. So I think those are some other things that we'll see this year in our pages. Thanks for telling us about what's going on with the journal these days and uh, no pressure for me, Kirk and Kevin being the highlighting the podcast as an important legacy for you. <laughs> but what we wanted to do next, since we have you here, is to talk about Dan Port. So this past year, we lost an icon in our field. He passed away at the age of 91, I think in the spring. And his contribution to our field are extensive. His research focused on understanding the pathophysiology of diabetes and its complications. We don't have time to list all of his accolades here, but um, he certainly played a large role in the American Diabetes Association. He served as president. He received the Banting Medal for Lifetime Service, the Outstanding Scientific Achievement Award, the Banting Medal for Lifetime Scientific Achievement, and the Albert Reynold Award for Outstanding Mentorship. So clearly, Dr. Port was revered not only for his science, but his mentorship abilities. And I know you overlapped with him at Washington. So we thought we'd ask you some questions about him and his legacy. Yeah, no, that, that, thanks very much, Dar. This is actually really important to me. We, we, Michael Schwartz and, and Stephen Kahn just wrote a very nice memoriam to Dan, and we published it. We've been publishing some of these things. Dan was sort of at the peak of his powers when I started fellowship in Seattle, and I wasn't a direct mentee of his, but if you were on the faculty or in the fellowship at Washington, you were in his club. He had a, this big tent approach, and he wanted to help everybody. It was certainly one of the uh, more fun and inspiring guys I've ever worked with. He, he could be challenging. In fact, he was always challenging but in a in a positive kind of jovial way. I remember I had to go out to the VA and, and present a research talk. And I, I told somebody I was working on my slides and they said, how many do you have? And, and I said, well, I have 15 or 20. He says, you only need three. Dan's not going to let you get further than three <laughs> slides before, before he hijacks the talk and you go some interesting direction. He wanted everybody in his tent to succeed. And, and he was always ready to read a grant, read a paper, hear your ideas. He was also always ready to tell you that they weren't any good and that you should do something better or modify things. He was very much that way. But he was, Dan was always on. When he was in a meeting, he was never looking out the window. He was never dozing off. He was always focused. And what I always said about Dan is he took all his jobs seriously, and especially he took his mentors his mentees, and that would be anywhere from other professors down to first-year fellows, very seriously. We didn't take himself seriously. Like he would much rather hear some first-year fellows experiments in a beta cell line than have somebody talk about all the awards he won, which he really never seemed to care about. <laughs> Dan had his most productive times, I think, in the 80s. And the 80s was when insulin resistance sort of ruled. The glucose clamp had come into being. Everybody was doing clamps. Everybody was trying to figure out insulin resistance because that was diabetes. And Dan would stand there and say, you can't have diabetes without beta cell dysfunction. And he said it over and over again, and he did the experiments to demonstrate that. And I think that's that broad concept is his legacy, that you can't have diabetes if you don't have beta cell dysfunction. And that's taken as a given now in the field, and we all just work from there. So no, Dan was a huge presence in the field and then for any of us that were lucky enough to have worked with him. So Dave, I'm wondering, you know, you've, you've touched upon Dan as, as a mentor and as a scientist. Is there some valuable scientific or mentoring lesson that you can put your finger on for us uh, that he really contributed to your career? Yeah, Dan emphasized it's not the easiest path forward that's the right path forward. It's the most important path forward. And so if, if, you, if you ever ended up in a discussion with him about your project and, and were leaning on things that you could do, he always wanted to know, no, no, no. he would, always wanted to change the discussion and say, no, what's the important issue here? Let's stick to that. We can figure out a way to do anything, but we need to pick the important issue to, to go ahead and change and chase. You know, that and the, the notion of collegiality, working together with people. It was never your work, his work. It was always, can we do this together? Can we take what we, what we know, what we can do together and move it forward? And again, that was part of, I think, 
him not taking himself too seriously. It was the work is what's important. Let's let's do what we can to get the work work forward. And I, I think that really shaped how I've approached running a lab, uh, working in groups, et cetera. It's always good to be able to fall back on that as a sort of a cornerstone to ground yourself with. That's really great, Dave. Thanks so much for talking to us today about the journal and about your experience with Dr. Port. Good. Well, thanks very much. I am delighted to have you also on our excellent editorial team. This is really great. Thanks very much. One of the features article from the January 2024 issue of Diabetes is titled, Fatty Acids Increase GDF-15 and Reduce Food Intake Through a GFRAL Signaling Axis. Today, we are joined by senior author of this paper, Dr. Gregory Steinberg. Dr. Steinberg is a professor in the Department of Medicine and co-director of McMaster's Center of Metabolism, Obesity and Diabetes Research. He holds the Canada Research Chair in Metabolism and Obesity and the J. Bruce Duncan Chair in Metabolic Diseases. Dr. Steinberg's research is focused on understanding molecular pathways, controlling the metabolism of fat and sugars, and how endocrine factors such as serotonin and growth differentiating factor 15 or GDF-15 regulate these effects. Welcome, Dr. Steinberg. Congratulations on being selected feature paper of the month, and thank you for being a part of this podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to speak to you today. So before we get to the science, we thought we'd start with a a little bit of an icebreaker here. And I want to know, is there anything in your personal life, uh, personal interest that intersects with or informs your work that you'd like to share with us? Oh, yeah. Lots of lots has to do with my personal life. You know, I'm very keen uh, exercise enthusiast, endurance exercise enthusiast. I was a swimmer, a competitive swimmer for many years and a uh, triathlete and uh, Ironman triathlete as well. So very interested in ways to improve my exercise performance. And that got me into, you know, studying energy sensing mechanisms from the beginning, initially AMP kinase and uh, later hormonal pathways controlling energy balance. Yeah, very cool. I think that might be a common theme among the group here. Yeah, for sure. athletes. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell us briefly, maybe briefly summarize the body of your work? And then kind of lead that into how did that lead to the premise for the current paper that we're discussing? Yeah. So, you know, we're, we've been very interested in understanding mechanisms controlling fatty acid metabolism, you know, for 25 plus years since our initial studies about how leptin regulated fat oxidation in muscle and uh, in potential ways to uh, how fat is controlled, uh, you know, and sensed within the body. We know there's a lot of really detailed pathways about how glucose is regulated through insulin and glucagon, but there's much less known really about how fatty acids are sensed and how our body responds to differences in fatty acid availability. And that really formed the basis for this study. How did you lead from that to GDF-15? Yeah, well, we had been interested in uh, GDF-15 from our initial studies where we identified GDF-15 as the top upregulated protein being secreted from hepatocytes in response to metformin. So we had a long uh, standing interest in understanding how metformin worked. We discovered that a, uh, metformin activated AMP kinase increased uh, ACC phosphorylation. This was important for improving insulin sensitivity in the liver. But what we couldn't explain was how metformin was having all these effects across a multitude of tissues. And that led us to the discovery that metformin increased the secretion of GDF-15 from uh, hepatocytes. And then, you know, from there, we had no idea what this meant because, you know, GDF-15 was the top at the time, you know, 2015, it was the top upregulated biomarker suggesting you were going to die. So it didn't really make sense with uh, metformin intake. Later on, we discovered, you know, oh, wow, it's this potent appetite suppressor. It increases energy expenditure. And this is how we really got into this idea that GDF-15 might be important. It was really serendipity related to metformin actions to increase GDF-15. And uh, that was basically the, the genesis of this project. So taking a little bit of a turn, we're leaving the hepatocyte. And how did you land on the kidney, right? Of all the target organs that could have been producing GDF-15. Why do you think fatty acids are so specifically stimulating kidney GDF secretion? Yeah, we really, 
you know, I didn't land on the kidney. The data landed on the kidney, really. It led us there. You know, I would have thought for sure, uh, based on our metformin work, that the liver would have been the primary tissue uh, contributing to GDF-15 release. We knew there was some connection between fatty acids and GDF-15, or at least we thought there should be, because, you know, one of the things that we discovered through the metformin projects was that if we gave mice, GDF-15 mice, metformin, and they were on a normal diet, it didn't affect their food intake that much. But it was only when they affected fatty acids, right? And in the high fat diet, GDF-15 really seems to not necessarily lower food intake of all food, like a GLP-1 receptor agonist. Instead, it really seems to be more specific to altering food preferences, right? So the mouse uh, seems to despise fatty foods when you give it GDF-15 or you treat it with metformin to increase GDF-15. So we thought there was this connection between fatty acids and GDF-15. And so when we gavaged mice, different fatty acid mixtures, and we saw this increase in GDF-15, we immediately looked across all multiple tissues. And the first experiment, we collected all the tissues, but we started out with the liver because we were sure that's where it was going to be coming from. And, and there was no change in liver GDF-15, at least mRNA expression. So that then led us to probe multiple, go through the line and probe multiple tissues. And that's where the kidney showed up. And, you know, it was a big surprise to me. So since this is a diabetes journal and, you know, the SGL2 inhibitors have such a large effect on improving HbA1c, do you think there's any room for this access to play a role in regulating glucose as well? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a really interesting work coming out around the role of GDF-15. You know, we discovered fairly recently that it definitely increases sympathetic drive through the brain axis and that this talks to the muscle and increases calcium cycling in the muscle. Others have shown that, you know, the same axis also communicates to the liver and uh, the adipose tissue. So if we increase futile cycling and adrenergic drive, just things like fat and muscle and increase futile cycling, we would certainly expect that glucose disposal would be enhanced. So we do think that there's weight independent effects of GDF-15 that could be important for improving insulin sensitivity and glucose homeostasis in uh, potentially people with diabetes. So looking forward, what are some of the key critical follow-up studies that you are working on or would like to conduct? Uh, where do you think that this uh, project is going? Yeah, so, you know, I don't know much about the kidney. I, it's a new uh, new realm for me, but I, I do appreciate enough about the kidney that, you know, it's a co very complex organ, right? You have a lot of different cell types in that in that kidney that are doing very opposite things in many cases, you know, proximal tubules cortex, all these different cell types, immune cells mixed in there. And so what we've noticed here is that GFRAL or GDF-15 expression is upregulated in certain parts of the kidney. You know, we still don't know what cell types are the primary cell types secreting that. And might this be important for fatty acid sensing? You know, what is the key cell type? So certainly something like a single cell or any sequencing experiment or spatial transcriptomics of the kidney would be, we think, very, very revealing to identify specific subtypes of cells releasing GDF-15. We certainly know macrophages certainly can express a lot of GDF-15, so that might be a top hit that we would be interested to look at. Greg, what's your take-home message for this particular paper, the key findings that you want people to really hold on to? Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's this general idea that, you know, GDF-15 is a, a sensor of cellular stress or damage necessarily, you know, and certainly paper out today, you know, talking about the placenta releasing GDF-15 and regulating uh, morning sickness, and that it's a general sensor of mitochondrial stress. And, you know, we think that it, it's more nuanced, that it has some physiological role other than sensing, you know, toxins. And certainly uh, our role, our idea here is that it is a direct sensor of mitochondrial health. And, you know, when you have a lot of fatty acids, you're overloading those mitochondria. And this is a feedback system to prevent that overload. And so, you know, GDF-15 is really unique in that the receptor is really only found in the brain, yet it can come from so many different cell types. So we think that's really interesting that it's a nutrient sensor, not just a, a stress sensor. If I could add one more thing, you know, I think uh, we're really keen on the idea that, you know, the kidney might be a, a relatively unexplored source of 
kidney kinds that could be important for controlling multiple aspects of metabolism. You know, we've looked extensively at the GLP-1, ghrelin, GIP, et cetera, for gut appetite regulating hormones. But, it, you know, to me, you know, the kidney hasn't been explored to the same depth. So this idea about that uh, there could be a kidney brain appetite regulating axis is, is kind of cool, I think. Definitely. Yeah. So, you know, stepping back a little bit, based on your findings, do you foresee any potential revisions or considerations in dietary guidelines, especially concerning fat consumption, right? And I guess by extension, you know, have you changed what's in your pantry? No, you know, uh, people are always amazed when they ask me what I eat and I eat everything, you know, <laughs> there's nothing I don't eat. Maybe that's because I exercise a lot. But, uh, you know, I do think there's some important in considerations around these findings. You know, could these findings potentially explain why high fat diets, uh, ketogenic type diets have more satiety like effects? This could be something of interest and certainly something we might hypothesis to be important. And, you know, it could be an important connection between sort of the energy balance model and the carbohydrate insulin model in the regulation of energy balance that I think would, could be important. Great. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Steinberg. Thanks for sharing your expertise with us today, and especially your recent work highlighting the interaction of fatty acids and GDF-15. I encourage all the listeners to read the full article, which is the feature article this month and is uh, freely available online and in the January issue of Diabetes. And I'm going to nominate kidney kinds as the word of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Now for a segment we're calling Sweet Talk. This is a segment where we will highlight additional articles and conference of interests and major events in the field. This month's Sweet Talk segment is a rapid fire discussion between Kirk and I, where we will briefly highlight a few additional manuscripts of interest in this month's journal. Yeah, thanks, Dar. This month, I'd like to actually highlight two articles. The first is titled Divergent Skeletal Muscle Metabolomic Signatures of Different Exercise Training Modes independently predict cardiometabolic risk factors, comes to us from uh, Pataki and colleagues. This clinical study investigates the link between enhancement of insulin sensitivity and muscle metabolites during 12 weeks of either high intensity interval training, resistance training, or a combination of both. Integrated transcriptomic and metabolomic analysis uncovered distinct metabolic signatures of the different exercise modes independently link each type of exercise training to improved insulin sensitivity and cardiometabolic risk. So Kirk, do you feel validated by this, uh, by this paper? Since <laughs> I know I follow you on Strava and I know you do a little bit of HIIT training. You know, I do, I do a little bit of everything. And I think that, sure, this validates the fact that you, you got to hit, you got to hit everything, right? <laughs> no pun intended. Especially as we get older, right? <laughs> oh, yes, yes. All right. My first article shout out is for a paper titled Single Cell Transcriptome Profiling of Pancreatic Islets from Early Diabetic Mice Identifies ANXA10 for Calcium Allostasis Toward Beta Cell Failure by Motomura et al. The premise for this paper is that although a decrease in beta cell function is a well accepted trigger for type 2 diabetes, a comprehensive understanding of the mechanism behind how this trigger happens is unknown. And so to try to expand our knowledge on this process, these authors carried out single cell RNA-seq from pre-diabetic and diabetic mouse models of type 2 diabetes. Their big picture finding was that they found a specific diabetes transcriptome in both endocrine and non-endocrine cell types. And they landed on the importance of, of ANXA10 as a pre-diabetic gene. This gene is overexpressed in the prediabetic beta cells and is linked to a variety of functions, including suppressing glucose-stimulated insulin secretion in a calcium-dependent manner, and it was also linked to compromised dedifferentiation and trans-differentiation processes. Yeah, Dar, this is a really cool paper, and I think that it's a great application of the single-cell seek technique that's really going to uh, have a big impact in multiple tissues and throughout the field. Yeah, I agree. So the second article I'd like to touch on uh, is titled Lysophosphatidyl inositols are upregulated following human beta cell loss and act to potentiate insulin release. This work is from Jimenez, Sanchez, and colleagues. 
and used lipidomic measurements on serum from a pre-diabetic mouse model of monogenetic diabetes. Here they identified a new lipid species associated with a loss of pancreatic beta cells. The authors also uncovered lysopis as the main circulating lipid species altered in the pre-diabetic setting. Very cool. My second paper is also pancreas related. This is a methodological review slash perspectives article titled Bridging the Gap, Pancreas Tissue Slices from Organ and Tissue Donors for the Study of Diabetes Pathogenesis by Coors et al. The pancreas tissue slice technology was developed as an insight to approach to overcome certain limitations associated with studies on isolated islets or fixed tissues. So in this perspective, the authors discuss the value of this novel platform and review how this technology has been rapidly integrated into numerous studies of rodent and human islet research. So to me, this seems like a really important tool that will be able to expand our understanding of how these various cells within the pancreas interact to regulate glucose homeostasis and other pancreatic functions. I mean, it's also kind of cool to think about the possibility that it will add to our understanding or add to that sort of methodological transition from isolated islets to an integrated physiological system. Yeah, absolutely. That's the end of our rapid fire. A couple of pancreatic articles, a little bit of exercise. I think we covered it. <laughs> all right. So thanks to all of you for joining us on our first Diabetes Bio podcast. We hope you enjoyed this little snippet of all that is the Diabetes Journal uh, and what it has to offer you each month. The feature article we discuss each month is freely accessible at diabetesjournals.org slash diabetes. Uh, and this is also listed in the episode notes for your reference. We look forward to presenting to you next month. Mm -hmm.